Well, hello and welcome to uh, Family and Community Focus. This is a program sponsored by the Collaborative Research Institute, the Institute for Community Health Promotion. I'm Kevin Miller, and in today's episode, we're going to talk about stress. Uh, everyone feels stressed from time to time. And one, th one of the things I've always found interesting is that what stresses out one person doesn't necessarily stress out another person. And this begs some curious questions as to what is stress, how does your mind, body, and health interact with stress, why does stress affect people differently, and what can be done about it? And fortunately, joining me to provide some answers and insight on the topic of the mind-body interactions with stress and inner treatment is Dr. Stephen Dabowski, Professor and Chair of the Department of Psychi uh, Psychiatric Psychiatry here at the University of Buffalo. Welcome and thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So maybe we can just begin with the first question of can we define stress? What is stress? Well, in the first place, stress is normal. Without stress, life would be boring. And, I mean, there wouldn't be any, anything happening. So uh, life is filled with stress. The question is, at what point does stress become overwhelming? And at what point are you not able to adapt to it? A, a reasonable amount of stress motivates us to do our daily activities, to deal with challenges. You take an exam in class, that's stressful. You're going to be a little bit nervous about the exam. Maybe you'll prepare better. If you're a little bit nervous, you'll be more careful in taking the exam and you'll do well. You're overwhelmingly anxious about taking an exam. It feels overwhelmingly stressful because you failed the last four exams. Then that stress response may interfere with your ability to study. You can't concentrate. You rush through the exam and don't, uh, and don't do as well. So the question is, at what level does stress make us feel overwhelmed? And at what point do we stop coping adaptively with stress and start coping maladaptively? Maladaptively meaning when it interferes with... Right, it interferes with our functioning and our ability to master common challenges. For example, a big issue these days in universities is diversity of opinion. So you have people who say, your opinion is so stressful to me that I can't tolerate it. I'm overwhelmed by having to hear something that I don't agree with. Therefore, you should stop stressing me by either shut up or go away or agree with me or I'm stressed right. out. Now that would be example, an example of a normal and actually useful amount of stress. How do you grow intellectually? How do you ever shape a real opinion except mm -hmm. through exchange of ideas? If everyone always agreed with you, you'd never learn anything. And if you already knew everything, well, you wouldn't be in school in the first place. Uh, so this is how we learn and how we grow and become better citizens and better adapted to the world. When a person says, it is so stressful to me to hear your opinion because the challenge to me is I then have to integrate what you say with my own opinion, which is divergent from that, and that's too difficult for me. I can't do it. That would be an example of a maladaptive response to a normal amount of stress. Not only does it interfere with the reasonable exchange of ideas in a university, which is uh, after all, um, uh, a knowledge factory. The purpose of a university is to exchange ideas and develop new thinking and, and uh, expand that thinking. Well, you're not going to achieve that goal mm -hmm. if nobody listens to anyone else. So this is maladaptive to the, the smaller society. It's maladaptive to society in general. And it's maladaptive to me if I can't hear anything I don't agree with or I shut down. Am I ever going to learn anything? You know, one place I find that interesting, that concept is uh, having worked uh, in facilities with individuals uh, in need, um, is working with children. And mm -hmm. sometimes, if you, whether you're a foster parent mm -hmm. or if you're a parent mm -hmm. um, or you are a child care worker who's employed by an agency, your expectations of what you're thinking about mm -hmm. should be happening. And the child mm -hmm. or the other adults you're working with don't do that expectation. 
uh, you can cause, that cause some anxiety and possibly, I think, mm -hmm. the stress you're talking about. Well, this is a, it's a very good example of the dependency on the situation of what's actually stressful. So all of us find it challenging to deal with a situation where our expectations are not met. That's always anxiety-provoking because we develop an idea of what things are supposed to be like. We go in there, we feel prepared. All of a sudden, it's different. Now we feel at sea. Now, when you're in the position of you have to help someone else who functions at a different level from you, your expectation is, oh, they're going to be like me. So they'll listen to reason. I say, no, you really can't bang your head on the wall. <laughs> bang. <laughs> you're not supposed to do that. Bang. Right. Um, well, let, let me explain to you why that is, and then you'll see and you'll agree with me. Well, that particular child may not be capable, at least at that moment, of understanding that, so you have to stop him. But if you view that as outside of your expectation of your role, that's going to be very stressful for you. The question is, how do you handle that stress? Mm -hmm. If you handle it by saying, I give up, and you run away, you're no help. If you handle the stress by smacking the, the, your uh, charge, because you, you don't know what else to do, that's not going to help either. So you have to adjust to the situation. And uh, you know, that's really what life is like most of the time. It hardly ever meets our expectations. I think anybody who's a parent or who's been around uh, has probably exhibited that. And they probably, you, we all could probably think back saying, well, I'd rather never cause my parents yeah, stress. Sure, well, right, that's right. <laughs> probably not an accurate statement. Was, you know that line from the uh, Fantastics, why can't they be like we were perfect in every way? <laughs> so we were all perfect as kids. But nowadays, See, in my day, it was never like this. Right. It was like this in everyone's day because it's a change of perspective for people, right. and that's stressful. And as you're saying, as new information, new knowledge develops, right. in some cases, our technology and various aspects right. of things that can contribute right. to that. I'm driving down the street. I see the lights green for me. My expectation is nobody's going to run the red light on the other side and run into me. So I just drive down the street, and I don't look. And one day, someone runs a light and smashes into me. That's not particularly adaptive. Instead, if I have any sense, I know that not everybody pays attention to the light, so I'll, I'll look. Right. I don't necessarily stop in the middle of the intersection, but I'll look. If I see somebody zooming, maybe I'll slow down, and I'm less likely to get hit. So in everyday life, we form expectations based on our own prejudgments and our own past experience. And a lot of times, those expectations are not met it's stressful. The question is, how do we adapt to it? I think uh, the other thing that well, is coming to my mind is that if you're the person in power, if you, or if you're a person that's caretaker or mm -hmm. whatever, uh, the ability to set expectations can help reduce stress because uh -huh. at least you can get them out there versus mm -hmm. somebody just behaves a certain way because they expected to behave that way. Uh -huh. You didn't match up yeah, with your right. expectations. And that's very, that's very true. Conflict. Yeah, that's very true. Um, so how does the mind and body react to and perhaps play a role in influencing stress? Well, our response to stress is a response to danger. What stress is is the perception of something, as I said, that doesn't meet our expectations and that produces the possibility of danger. Because if I know everything that's going to happen, I'm in no danger. I can predict every conceivable contingency. So whenever things don't match, that stress Stress turns on a system in our body called fight-flight. And what this does is prepare us to interact with something that's dangerous or to run away from it. We have another type of stress response called conservation withdrawal. And what that involves is simply slowing everything down and waiting till things get better. An example of this would be hibernation. So a bear in the winter can't find food. You can either migrate 2,000 miles or go to sleep for a few months until it stops snowing and it warms up. Uh, and these are the three ways we have of dealing with stress. These are programmed into our nervous systems. The fight-flight part, what this does is there is a part of um, the deep part of our brain called the locus ceruleus. And what this part of the brain does is recognizes danger and responds to it. It turns on that fight-flight response if it makes a judgment that this, uh, this involves some element of danger. And if you just think about yourself driving down the road on an icy road, you, you skid a little bit, your heart kind of beats fast, you feel kind of shaky, 
your mouth feels a little dry. These are physical responses to, um, to the perception of danger. When you either interact with the danger and overcome it, or you escape from it, or you define it as no longer dangerous, normally that stress that response, that fight-flight response, will turn itself off and the physiology of your body will return to normal. If the stress is very prolonged, or if you're not able to master it in one of these ways I've just described, then the stress response continues. And what's happening in that stress response? Your body is, first of all, preparing for danger. So blood flow changes. You're sending more blood flow to muscles, to organs of action, and blood flow is directed uh, to some extent away from non-essential organs like your skin, which is why your skin will feel clammy or cold at times, uh, while your heart is beating fast. Your adrenal glands, which are connected to the stress response, are putting out two types of stress hormones. One type of stress hormone is called um, epinephrine and it's because of norepinephrine. These are hormones that circulate through the body to prepare you metabolically for challenge. Another adrenal hormone is called cortisol. The purpose of this hormone is to suppress immunity. And the reason from, for that, from an evolutionary standpoint, is if you're facing physical danger, which is how all this evolved, before we evolved the capacity to think and, and think symbolically about, have symbolic dangers, all our dangers were real physical dangers. If you're in physical danger, you may be injured. If you're injured, you don't want your immune system to attack damaged tissue, thinking that now it's been changed and you have to eliminate it so you don't want to attack your own body. So your immune response will turn itself down. And normally that all resets itself and you're fine. If your body happens to be vulnerable to the physical dimensions of the stress response, you may overwhelm it. So for example, if your heart is prone to abnormal rhythms or your blood pressure tends to fluctuate or be high in the first place, as you get this stress response, it may overwhelm your cardiovascular system. You may develop severe hypertension. You may develop a cardiac problem. If your immune system is sensitive, you may ha shut off immunity and that may have severe consequences too. Now with long-term stress, we then end up turning on other types of systems through uh, hormonal interactions that promote immunity and that promote an immune response on the grounds that you're going to be encountering foreign substances that you want to be able to suppress. That immunity then attacks your own body and then you have your own immune system causing a variety of problems right. ranging from different inflammatory diseases, uh, uh, lupus, for example, would be one example of an inflammatory disease can be aggravated, sometimes brought out, usually is aggravated by this ongoing uh, stress response. The one that, uh, the, what, what begs the question again is, is going to be, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a, in a minute, is you know, how do you recognize it in yourself and why do you do something? But the hibernation one is the one that you mentioned a little bit. I want to touch on maybe just a little more. That to me reminds me of somebody who might retreat to the room. Yes. Uh, more like a, I don't want to, like a melancholic kind of thing, almost mm -hmm. like a depression, mm -hmm. symptomatic kind of way uh -huh. of responding. From a physiological standpoint, conservation, withdrawal, hibernation has something in common with depression. But if you look at the physiology of conservation, withdrawal, what's happening is you're turning everything down. So you've made the judgment, you may or may not be conscious, your body has made the judgment, I can't get away from this, I can't overcome it, I'm just simply going to ride it out. Your nervous system turns itself down, your heart rate slows, your body temperature slows, instead of your metabolism speeding up in fight flight, you're putting out more glucose to fuel, uh, they provide an energy supply for action uh, organs, here you're turning down your metabolism. Now if you look at a depressed person who looks just like that, very withdrawn, won't get out of bed, seems like can't think clearly, very slowed down, if you look at them physiologically, they are in an extreme state of fight flight. Their heart rate is increased, not slowed down. Their metabolism is speeded up, 
not slowed down. And what's happened here is they're overwhelmed by fight yeah. flight and they just kind of shut down. Kind of like the, 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 the hibernation example would be there's, you're waiting for, for the gas station to open. You just park and shut your car off and it stays there until the gas station opens. In depression, what's happening is your car's revving so much it starts burning up, your wheels are spinning, you're over revving in a low gear and not getting anywhere. Uh, so physiologically, that's the difference between depression, which is maladaptive, and conservation withdrawal, which is generally adaptive. And, and when you're working, I guess the idea of working with kids or even adults, and they need mm -hmm. that little, call time out sometimes. Right. They need just yeah. a little time away uh -huh. to be able to recoup, re exactly. you, know, you know, and all that kind of, it's a good thing. There are people who get very overwhelmed in particular situations. And a lot of times we feel obligated to resolve it right there. Right. And as you point out, a lot of people just say, why don't you take a break? This works with your kids. Go to your room, take a break for a few minutes. Not you're grounded for the rest of your life. Right. Take a few minutes, slow down, calm down a little bit. And the same for me. And let's come back to it when we're both calmer because we're so activated at this point. We're both so stressed. We're no longer interacting adaptively. Right. So the... Um I mean, you kind of hit on a lot of these questions that I was, had in here about the, bo the, the body influence on the mental states and mm -hmm. all that. Um, maybe the other way is the mind affecting the body. And uh -huh. That's the perception part I think you were talking about mm -hmm. and how that plays out. Well, um, the organ of the mind is the brain. So God gave us thought and he gave us an organ of thought. And that's a brain. If you didn't have a brain, you wouldn't be able to think. You wouldn't be able to assess your environment, you wouldn't be able to know how to respond and, and uh, adapt to life. So everything that happens in our environment is translated through our brain. It's not coming through the air or anything. It's, it's not coming through prana, energy particles in the air. It's impacting our nervous system. Our nervous system then sends signals to various parts of our body as to how to respond. Because we have the capacity to remember things to think sim and to think symbolically, we can interpret a lot of things as dangerous that might or might not really be dangerous, or there might be a real danger that we don't shut off necessarily. In that case, our brain is saying, turn on these systems of fight flight or turn them off for conservation withdrawal. And that's having multiple effects on different organ systems uh, in our body. So in fact, our mind has quite a bit of control over our body, both good and bad. We're more aware of the bad parts. Mm -hmm. The good parts are harder to achieve because they involve resolving that stress response. To use the example I said before, if your, your idea of dealing with stress is make the world stop being stressful, however you've defined that, you're going to have a mighty tough time shutting off that physiology of fight-flight. If you're able to say, okay, that's stressful, but I can't overcome it necessarily, but I, there are some things I could do to make it a little bit better, to feel like I have some sense of control. There are some ways I can learn to reduce that level of, of arousal and fight-flight that I've got then you're mitigating the effect of stress on your body. Let's, let's, we've got a couple minutes left in that kind of, but maybe we can talk about what those are, mm -hmm. what those things people can do to do this. Because I know that we all look at it through, I always look at it as lenses. Yeah. Okay. A person who wears glasses, yeah. without them, I don't see some stressful things. Yeah. 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 I'm, not gonna, I'm not going to, because okay. they're not in my per, you know, yeah. perception. Sure. I can't grasp them. Okay. But what can I do other than wearing, you know, I wear glasses for yeah. my vision, okay. what can we do for our vision of stress? Well, some stress, is good to recognize. Like if a guy's running a red light, it's good to be wary of it. Some stress, you're better off redefining, put on a different pair of glasses. You may have astigmatism and you may need a, a different prescription. And to use the example I mentioned earlier of an everyday thing, if you think that as someone who disagrees with you that that's stressful, you've got a problem unless you want to live in a padded cell or you know, buy yourself an island somewhere. So you're going to have to deal with that. So the first step is redefine what's stressful. And is this really a danger to me or not? To the extent it is a danger, how do I deal with it 
and um, in a way that I have some sense of mastery or control over it because it's that feeling uh, that you're a passive, helpless victim that turns on that stress response. Mm -hmm. To the extent you have a sense of mastery and control, it will turn it down. The mastery and control is usually not achieved by beating up the person who disagrees with you because that's going to cause other problems and it won't help you define the world as something you can really interact with because you can't beat up everybody. So what you have to look at is, okay, I don't agree with this. I, I can deal with this. Here's something I can't do anything about. I'm going to let that go because it's not going to hurt me. Here's something I can do something about and I'm going to address that. Then there are things we can do to settle our bodies down. And those involve learning relaxation techniques. Uh, there are very structured techniques that are quite useful for this. One of the newer techniques is very helpful in taking your mind off of things that feel overwhelming and particularly that orient your thinking toward internally generated stress. In other words, I see this as overwhelmingly stressful. Nobody else does, mm -hmm. but I do. What I've got to do is either redefine this as it's not stressful or take my mind away from this internally generated idea and onto something that makes me feel calmer and more in control. This technique is technically called mentalization. Mm -hmm. It involves an element of meditation. From a physiological standpoint, you are turning your attention away from internally generated negative states associated with negative thinking and onto something where you feel more in control. And that can be very useful. If you practice this kind of thing a lot, then you're like some of the yogis who can change the temperature of one finger by 10 degrees, for example. Wow. Um, there is a wonderful treatment, that, speaking of this, for migraine headaches, which are the change in um, uh, blood flow in the uh, outside of your head. Uh, and uh, if you learn to raise the temperature of one finger, it redirects blood flow and it's a great treatment for migraine headaches, also for hypertension. There are mechanical ways of doing this with things called biofeedback mm -hmm. that will also teach you to relax your muscles, gain a sense of relaxation. There are visualization techniques that are also very useful. And the more you practice these, the more you are defining yourself as someone who is interactively, interacting constructively with a stressful situation by redefining it or muting your response to it, you're protecting your body, you're protecting your mind, and you're giving yourself a greater um, ability to control a, a stressful world. I'm going to have to have a close on that, but there's a lot more I'd like to talk to you about because I actually have some background in the biofeedback stuff and what we were doing with teachers. Mm -hmm. And the idea was we were going to have parents have to go through a little biofeedback thing before they went into the principal's office uh, or the yeah, kids yeah. to do that, to do some kind of technique so that while they're angry coming in, we want to get them to a point where we can have a productive conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, we were going to do that with children. And I actually have done some work with high school kids. And, uh, uh -huh areas and uh, it's very fascinating but you mentioned a lot of possibilities I think we highly encourage people to look for those possibilities and try to find those uh, I hope you enjoyed today it was a very uh, I think informative very quick segment uh, Dr. Steve uh, Dabosky a professor and chair of Department of Psychiatry thank you You're very welcome. My pleasure.